were about 65 million total combatants that fought in World War I. Of that, there were about approximately 20 million deaths and 21 million casualties, which meant basically if you're going to war, you've got about a 66 to 70 percent chance that something is going to happen and you're going to go through it. It's a very famous, one of my most famous shots. This is taken by an Australian photographer of them going through no man's land on the duck boards, but just complete devastation as far as the eye could see. It's interesting, I was in New York City speaking uh, to Belgium uh, Memorial Day last year and met a World War II veteran. And that World War II veteran was in the European theater. And he was telling me a story about walking through the fields of poppies during World War II. And he said, as I was reflecting on the death at this very field amongst the poppies, the Flanders Fields poem that many of us are familiar with, he said a battle broke out and it all occurred and started over again in the very same spot that had happened uh, 20 to 30 years prior. So I thought that was just a very ironic, ironic story. It's Rocco Moretti was his name. So one of the towns completely crushed and devastated here. So then we come to November 11, 1918. And that is what eventually we led up to, which was Armistice Day. And all parties said that's about it. That's as far as we go uh, with this war. So it took about five treaties to close down the war. And fighting continued into the 20s in different areas around, around Europe and into Russia and different areas. But Armistice Day was November 11, 1918, the 11th day of the 11th hour. They signed papers to cause the guns to cease. And world War is over because it was only, they thought, there would only be one world war. This was the last one, we thought. <coughs> Interestingly enough, Mr. Buckles guarded the World War I POWs at the end of the war, and one of his jobs was helping escort German prisoners back at the end of the war. Uh, probably Rex also did that and helped with the uh, rebuilding of Germany. And then we also had the William Seegers, who I photographed from Germany, who helped guard the Americans. So I heard firsthand accounts from all of them talking about the conditions. And Mr. Buckles went up to one of the Germans when there was food again, and he spoke in German to him, and the, because he spoke in German, the German gave him an extra slice of bologna, and that was a pretty big thing. <laughs> this I just discovered this week in doing research for this. This is up in Russia with surplus of gas masks and things from World War I, and it's just kind of a very surreal image that just really blows your mind as to how bizarre this experience truly was. Here you've got some kids with a machine gun or uh, simulated machine gun down here. But as far as the eye can see, you've got this parade of gas masks and the old truck. Very haunting image. <coughs> so it brings us to the Treaty of Versailles, which was called the greatest moment in history. Uh, Versailles, France. This was signed June 28. Um, and this led and laid the groundwork for World War II, which we'll talk briefly about here. This is the Pact Room. Then, Treaty of Versailles, signed June 28, 1919. 70 delegates from 27 nations negotiated this treaty. The big three uh, was Woodrow Wilson, and Prime Minister George's, try to pronounce that, Clemenceau, and uh, David Lloyd George from the British Prime Minister. So the French, the British, and the American President pretty much did the, the primary thing here. Excluded were Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia. Russia still had its own issues going on. The final signing here. Key terms were Germany had the war guilt clause, and they basically said this was all our fault. And with that, Germany took on a staggering 6.6 .6 billion pounds, uh, not in weight, but in monetary penalty 
that they were to pay back to the Allies, which completely strapped them. This infuriated uh, a young man who fought in World War I, that man would be Adolf Hitler. Um, it cut the German army to about 100,000 men, slightly less. Their wartime weapons had to be scrapped. Navy cut to 36 ships and no submarines. They were banned from having the Air Force. And then as a result, their area that had previously been the German Empire was divvied up into what we now know as Poland, Finland, Lithuania, Latvia, Czechoslovakia. They were made independent countries as a result of World War I. What it effectively did is it crushed the, many of the royal families and split the empires up and transformed and laid, like I said, laid the groundwork for the nation and the continent of Europe as we know it today. What the Germans didn't like, the German Navy commanders didn't like, was to turn over their ships. Most interesting, we're surrounded by models of battleships and the submarine out the window here, interesting to look at, but the Germans commander said, not happening, not on my watch, we're not handing them over. So they scuttled the fleet or sank their ships in the harbor, I believe, uh, up near England. And this is them scuttling one of the German um, German destroyers, they sank them all. And a couple of the vets that I interviewed saw that. And this is a very interesting photograph of one of the German destroyers in a rescue barge, and they've actually built, I don't know, offices on top of the bottom of the ship. <laughs> so they reclaimed those German ones. So this is the Versailles room where the peace treaty was signed today. So the rise of Hitler. Hitler fought in World War I, displayed on his chest here is the Iron Cross, which he received during World War I. But he really felt that they were stabbed in the back and mistreated through the Treaty of Versailles. And because of that, he began and wanted to scrap the Treaty of Versailles and renege and go back on the peace plan that was set up, which effectively set up the chessboard for World War II, a continuation of World War I. So they stopped paying back the six plus billion pounds, and at one point the French actually invaded part of Germany and tried to force labor uh, to get that paid back. That didn't go over very well. He began rearming Germany, gained size and strength. With that, he used as his political vehicle to transform the mind and start perfecting his propaganda machine to advance the will of the people, to transform the will of the people, to follow blindly the leader that would eventually lead them to World War II. He went back, took over Poland and the Czech Republic, which led us to World War II. brings us up to Munich. So